And my big question for you is, can biologically inspired engineering help us face some of our world's toughest challenges, not just in human health and disease, but also for the environment and for sustainability? I'm In Siu Hyun, Director of the Center for Life Sciences and Public Learning at the Museum of Science in Boston. Today, my guest is Don Ingber, Founding Director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard. Today, we chat about biologically inspired engineering. What is it? And how could it help us solve some of the world's toughest problems? So Don, thank you so much for joining us today. You are the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard. And that name itself is fascinating to me because biologically inspired engineering is a term that I think is new to many people. It's um, an inviting phrase. It kind of suggests that engineering is not just cold, hard math, but could be actually inspired by the world around us. Could you tell us a little bit more about this concept of biologically inspired engineering? It's not a very new concept, but please unpack that. Yeah, you know, when you know when we started about 15, 18 years ago, um, we, we were tasked with thinking about an institute that would that would basically create the engineering of, of 30 years in the future. And so we looked backwards and we saw that engineering has transformed basically all fields, you know, medicine, engineering, manufacturing, uh, industrial production. We realized that the boundaries between all the disciplines were breaking down. Physicists were collaborating with biologists and chemists and so forth. We realized that we've uncovered an incredible amount of, about how nature builds, controls, manufactures from the nanoscale up. And so we basically thought we could flip it on its head, that now we could actually leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. This is what I called at the time biologically inspired engineering. And I, and I think it, it's really proven true. If you could talk about nature almost like as a person, nature is an incredible engineer, it's an incredible builder, right? Could you imagine trying to build a little creature that starts off as a caterpillar and it can spin a silk cocoon and transform itself into a butterfly? Uh, to, to actually engineer something like that would be remarkable. I mean, but nature knows how to do it on its own. I know, it's, it's, it's a self-organizing, self-assembling system, but it also builds in stages and, it's, and it basically leverages bits that were used before, almost like cassettes, that it puts together mm -hmm. and combines in new ways and builds hierarchically more, more complexity. And um, these are design principles, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so oftentimes, you know, in a sense, you could think of uh, a car as many modules that they put together, but nature does it through you know, biocompatible materials that are manufactured, you know, with water as a base, not using harsh chemicals, mm -hmm. and that uses living cells to basically create the blueprint and build it by collectively with other cells. There's nothing like that in man-made systems. But people are now able to begin to use living cells and reprogram them, reprogram them to, to create artificial materials that you can integrate with cells and guide them in different ways, or combine man-made materials with living cells, kind of biohybrid materials, and to take the advantage of what cells can do, but also the advantage of what man-made materials can do. So it, it, it is, you know, you're absolutely right. Nature does it like nobody else, and that's why we're inspired by it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people might think that engineering is kind of boring and it's, it's cold, but when you say it's biologically inspired. I mean, it, it kind of starts to bring a warmth or an accessibility to engineering. It's truly the melding of mm -hmm. biology and engineering. And with, mm -hmm. within that comes physics and chemistry and, com and now computer science. But it, 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 it's where the fields have emerged and are now becoming something new. Is it a field where somebody gets training in this uh, or, or does it have to be, you know, like an amalgam of people from different backgrounds? It, it's really, a, it's a, it's a collaborative game, <laughs> you know, art where you, you really, I, I say the way you really do breakthrough work is you bring together, you know, experts in different areas who are all excited about the same challenge or problem, and they, it's so difficult they can't solve it on their own. But if you bring the right complement collaborators in areas they don't have expertise, but they know they need to to work in, then amazing things happen. And 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 so it is transdisciplinary, meaning you don't have to have many disciplines, but it's collaborative 
and it, it, it really is sort of team science. Yeah. Now, you've been involved in this concept for a long time, right? Way back in the 70s, back when you were in college. Well, in college, um, I guess I got into the world of transdisciplinarity serendipitously. In fact, a lot of the major steps in my life are serendipitous. <laughs> but um, I, I got into, yeah, I went to public high school. I got into Yale. Uh, winning the math awards. I, I got turned off to math in classes that it was so sophisticated uh -huh. that didn't seem like fun. Uh -huh. um, I always had an interest in nature and I always had an interest in how things work. I was always mechanically minded, mm -hmm. but I, I um, also had an, for whatever reason, natural interest in art without ever doing much art. Uh -huh. And so um, I was taking a class in, um, what, what was called basically molecular biophysics, which is like how molecules work. Uh -huh. And it, this is in the mid seventies. And what I was learning is that it's the, th it's the three dimensional form mm -hmm. of the molecule, three dimensional design of the molecule. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the idea of the lock and key with an enzyme and a substrate. It's the idea uh -huh. that the DNA helix, it's actually the shape of the helix that allows it uh -huh. to separate, come together in defined ways. And I saw, kids walking around campus who were taking an art class with sculptures that look uh -huh. just like DNA, viral capsids, uh -huh. you know, viral structures. And, and I asked, what, what course did you build that in? And they said, it's called three-dimensional design. And so like I, I fought to get in this course. Uh -huh. And in that course, I, I was introduced serendipitously. The teacher asked us to build structures made of sticks and strings where the strings Basically, he told us in a, in a class, it was one of the most creative, actually stimulating classrooms I've ever had. He said, uh, you have sticks that are about a foot long. Mm -hmm. You have strings. You, they're little places to tie them at the ends. He said, I want you to build three-dimensional structures that hold themselves up in, in 3D, but the sticks can't touch. And he left the room. <laughs> and we all looked at each other. Uh -huh. And I think one of the students must have been an art student who had seen sculptures by an artist named Kenneth Snelson or Buckminster Fuller's sculptures, but they're called tensegrity. And they basically, um, by having the strings in the right way, the strings pull the, the sticks up against gravity and stabilize it. Mm -hmm. Turns out it's the way our bodies are built. Okay. Like if you go to an anatomy lab ever, you mm -hmm. will see a skeleton. And the reason it looks like us is they wire it together and hang mm -hmm. it from a stick. But in reality, we're 206 you know, bones that are stiff that are pulled up against the force of gravity by a continuous series of muscles, tendons, ligaments, and fascia. And it's mm -hmm. the, the tone in your muscle tone mm -hmm. the, or tension that makes us you know, stiff or flexible or standing or lying down. And that is called in engineering, a pre-stress, isometric mm -hmm. tension. That is a fundamental principle of these tensegrity structures. But what was life-changing for me was that the professor built these out of elastic strings and sticks, and it was round. And as he talked, he would flatten it mm -hmm. against the, the, the desktop and it flattened and he'd let it go and it bounced up in the air round. And wow. by chance, I had just learned how to culture cells in a, in a cancer research lab as wow. an undergrad. Uh -huh. And I saw cells, when you put them on a dish, flatten. And when you clip their anchors, they round up. And I had heard 1975, they had just said that all cells have what's called a cytoskeleton, mm -hmm. a little molecular skeleton at the nanoscale. So I assume this is the way cells are built. And then uh, I went back to my lab, cancer lab, and we had a drug that changed the shape of the cell. And I said, oh, the tensegrity changed. And the postdoc looked at me and said, what do you say? And I described, you know, art class, Buckminster Fuller's sculptor. He said, never say that again. <laughs> and so I went back to the library and that was sort of the beginning of the rest of my life in science, which is I went to the art library, the biology yeah. library, the physics library, chemistry library, and I saw a theme about this is the way nature built. So when you went on to do your PhD, you did that on tensegrity. That must have just really captivated you to-, to Actually, carry. I did my PhD on um, uh, cancer and what makes a normal tissue become cancerous. Mm -hmm. But the more I read about it, and you have to realize a hundred years ago, everything was described in terms of mechanics. Mm. And then when molecular, when, when chemistry and genetics came in, it was the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. Mm. I, I actually saw that mechanics could be involved, structure, three-dimensional organization. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that tensegrity could explain my ideas. That, and I started to build models 
And that's how I, tensegrity was part of my thesis. That's absolutely true. But that wasn't what my thesis was on. Uh -huh. And actually the idea that mechanics is important for cancer formation or why normal tissues break down and become cancer is now a very hot area in science. Mm -hmm. it took 35 years, but it's now well accepted. <laughs> You know, there's almost like a playfulness to what you're describing of taking an idea from art, kind of combining it with something you're learning in, in a cell biology class. Um, that playfulness, I think, it, to me, speaks very well to kind of this idea of biologically inspired engineering where, you, where you're taking ideas in a, in a playful way. It's almost like a postmodern kind of approach to science. You know, plus I mean, I, when I created the Vs Institute, I mean, we, we've created a kindergarten for some of the world's most creative, brilliant people, and, and we give creative freedom to all these young people to explore. And I was very lucky as a child to take, get into a special program, it was called the Elementary Accel Acceleration Program, where we, we did three years of work in two, but we actually had special art teachers, special music teachers, and we would, you know, read, um, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island, we would see five different movie versions of it. Mm -hmm. We would make puppets, we would put on a play. So you saw all these different perspectives. Everything was just different perspectives on the same thing. I think that's affected me from a very young time to like not see boundaries between disciplines. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, going back to bio inspiration, if, if you look at how nature does things, it does them, you know, incredibly efficiently at no cost it's their self-healing they don't use harsh things to manufacture mm -hmm. and so i mean i think early on I, I realized that we could learn an incredible amount about nature and i tried to read up as much as i can and and look for principles more than parts where in science when i was training and now too it's so reductionist it's so focused on like what's this made of like what's the gene what's the this what's the, that's not the way biology works. It works mm -hmm. as collectives. And I think those, those are like fundamental principles, networks, collective interactions, hierarchical things, small parts put together, new functions emerge, multiple parts come together, new functions emerge. Think of our cells are made of molecules, our tissues are made of cells, our organs are made of tissues. Each one has different functionality. Those are principles that, that do come into what the field of biologically mm -hmm. designed engineering now does. I know that the Wies Institute has a very strong social mission, and I want to get into that in a, in a moment. But I want to start things off now with the big question. And my big question for you is, can biologically inspired engineering help us face some of our world's toughest challenges, not just in human health and disease, but also for the environment and for sustainability? Yeah, I mean, so the Wies Institute has two major target areas, healthcare and sustainability. And I, and I think the, in, we've been uh, primarily doing healthcare, but we've also done sustainability so far. But I think the future is one where that's where more and more emphasis will be, because I think it's the, that's where biologically inspired engineering could have the greatest impact. You think about, um, I was listening on the radio here and, and they were talking about carbon sequestration and the huge challenges and the underestimation of how much we need to do to have an impact on mm -hmm. climate change. Well, you know, people think about simplistic things like putting carbon under the earth or, or you know, producing less carbon. But, you know, nature is the biggest user of carbon. And then the output are manufacturing of things we want, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, sugars or polymers or, you know, materials. And that's a great example where synthetic biology, where you actually mm. people are now engineering uh, whole complex networks in the genome, circuitry to uh, take a carbon dioxide, which is now produced, let's say, by a manufacturer, and this is a, like a company that just spun out of the Vs uh, mm -hmm. called Circe, where let's take a beer manufacturing. Major output is carbon dioxide, which is killing the environment. This, by engineering microbes that you can culture in vats, they could take that CO2 and they could make products. They could make fats for foods, which are like, you know, natural, you know, this, no animal had to be extracted for it or killed or have cows add gas, methane gas to the environment. You could use it to manufacture um, jet fuels. You can, so you, you can think of, it's not taken into the calculations of climate change to have technologies that use, if you imagine if this spread out for all kinds of manufacturing, 
that could be a huge way to, to reduce carbon dioxide in the environment. There are technologies out of the VEAST that you would never expect to be uh, sustainability or energy, for example. One of those, Joanna Eisenberg, one of our faculty, developed the technology that she wanted to develop a way to prevent ice from sticking to airplane wings. Mm -hmm. And she was looking for non-stick surfaces. And here she was inspired by a particular, it's almost a little bit biomimicry, um, it's called the pitcher plant in Africa. And it's, mm. it's, a, it's really, it's sort of like a Venus flytrap. When it's dry, insects can crawl all over it. When it gets wet, they slip in and it eats them. <laughs> okay, so she tried to figure out like, why is it so slippery? It turned out to be a nanostructured surface that held the liquid. She makes artificial materials. There's a company now that sells those um, to prevent barnacles from sticking to ships, which you think, oh, that's nice. but the amount of energy saved by having decreased resistance of having a smooth ship is huge for the environment. She showed that you can coat uh, refrigeration coils on a refrigerator and not have ice sticking. Well, if anybody has a refrigerator freezer and they have to clear the ice off you know, every year, that decreases energy efficiency. Things like this actually mm -hmm. are part of sustainability. But the other thing about the VEAST that's amazing is that because we do both healthcare and sustainability, we're without bounds, my group took that technology and leveraged it to coat medical devices so you don't get blood clot formings mm -hmm. because it's so slippery. It's like a slipping on liquid. It's like an ice skater when you, mm -hmm. on ice, it melts and you're on water. Mm -hmm. And that's now in a commercialized with a different company. And, and uh, you know, an example is there are kids who have um, shunts in their brain who have swollen, uh, the, the sinuses of their brain swell, it's called hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. And they have a shunt put in to relieve the fluid, and now they clog, and they average one to two years, they have to do major surgery to take it out. There's great evidence with this in preclinical pre that if you coat it with this, you have long-term survival. So this came out of you know a bio-inspired idea to solve a problem that was pretty uh, targeted, not obviously sustainability, yet that's what we do. It's like you're saying, you kind of fold in, like you're cooking creatively. Okay, we have this, what could we use it for? Now we could use it for that. What could, you know, how does, how can we adapt it for something else? And so we develop what we tend to think of as platform technologies, something that you develop, but then could be used for many different things. And so that's, a, I think, a signature of the V's. Yeah, now what are some examples from healthcare? Um... Um, you know, healthcare, uh, there are, are, are many, um, you know, a technology out of my group that has gotten a, a lot of attention is called human organs on chips. And here's, you know, a, 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 this is true bio-inspired. It's also what some people call bio-hybrid because it has man-made and non-man-made things in it. But um, the challenge was what's the, one of the biggest problems that we could see in, uh, in medicine today is that uh, most drugs fail when they get to the clinic. This is a major cause of the healthcare crisis in terms of costs. People aren't getting great drugs. And then there are ethical issues because of animal testing. And, and, it's ap and actually, up until a month ago, it was absolutely required by the FDA to do animal tests before you go to humans. And now just a quick aside, partly because of this technology, the, the Congress passed a change in the law that now you could use uh, preclinical tests with human cells, including organ chips, uh, as a replacement. Um, but uh, so, or, so the idea was, you know, well, could we mimic organ level responses in a, in a with with cultured cells? And uh, the challenge was like, what are the design principles that that make an organ an organ? Mm -hmm. And and they they actually you can distill it down to some simple ones, which is uh, t you have to have two or more tissues come together, usually like a blood vessel type of tissue, and let's say the lining of your lung. And then also you have to have blood supply, right, flow. And then I was interested always in mechanical forces and have shown for years that mechanical forces can be as important as chemicals and genes. And so we wanted to have the mechanical microenvironment. So we started, a breakthrough was a lung on a chip. That, that's, that's the design principle, but why not take the best of engineering and, and, and apply it to. So we took computer microchip manufacturing approaches, which you can make many things at large scale at low cost, and you have control over the features at the same size scale that cells and tissues live at. And we made these little hollow channels inside a device that's the size of a, of a computer memory stick. And we made it out of an optically clear material that's sort of rubbery. 
and, and you could think of it like a tunnel that you drive through. So <clears throat> we, make the t we split the tunnel into top and bottom and we have a porous membrane we put in the lung. We'll put lung lining cells on top. We'll put lung blood vessel, capillary blood vessel cells underneath. We just recreated what's called the alveolar capillary interface. That is where we have gas exchange, drug delivery, you know, metastasis, pneumonia, COVID. Um, and then because it's all flexible, we had side chambers and we apply cyclic suction and it stretches these cells and relaxes them at the same rate and degree when we breathe. Doing that, we can recreate lung functions at a level never seen before. And we've now done this with 15 different organs. We just showed a liver chip that is seven to eight times better than animal models at predicting liver toxicities in drugs with drugs where we knew the animal said it was safe and it wasn't in humans. And th that in part is what's led to this, a change with the Congress passing what's called the FDA Modernization Act. Uh, so, you know, that's an example of bio-inspired at a level that you don't, it's not biomimicry, it's it's really uh, being inspired by it, but then think what are the tools you could bring together from engineering, biology, medicine to accomplish a goal? Yeah, now I can see in the healthcare arena, um, this type of work could have a huge impact and it already seems to be doing so with FDA. In sustainability for environment, um, it seems like you have different players, like you don't have like a patient advocacy group, you don't have, you know, like investigators at hospitals, that are kind of driving and pushing for, like demanding for that technology. Is is it a challenge to kind of get like uptake in some of the stuff it's, that you're doing? It's a really interesting question. I, I'm, when we started, we were doing work on building materials, um, you know, energy, um, and there were the, the real challenge wasn't interest groups, it was investors. And the medical world has venture capitalists who put huge amount of money to do startups that, you know, big companies won't take risks, and that's really what's transformed, you know, the whole the whole healthcare system. They, what, they didn't exist in building materials, in environmental materials. Now that has changed in the last five years. And that's just because the environmental crisis is so huge. I th and I think people see their opportunities there. You know, you could see with the Tesla and the electric car 10, 15 years ago, everybody thought it was gonna be impossible and then the, it just shifted overnight. So I, I was just at a meeting in the National Academies on biohybrid materials, bio-inspired materials, and there's just numerous in companies investing in the space. So you are beginning to see companies uh, that are making, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial leathers out of mushroom, um, you know, the whole alternative food industry, which the Vise is beginning to get into, leveraging what we developed for medical materials, like for art, instead of making an artificial uh, liver, you can make an artificial muscle tissue. So tell me a little bit about how ideas come to fruition at the V. So I mean, it must be a little combination of there's a problem that needs to be solved and then people get behind it. And maybe a, another process of just like imaginative play and discovery. And then you find, oh, this thing that we were developing could have a certain application. Is there a kind of a little so, bit of both? So the first thing on? I would say is that what makes the V unique probably to many other places is that we're more problem focused. So it's like if a group comes to us, whether it's a funding agency, a company, you know, a, a donor who has a, you know, a, a child with a problem, um, we will bring the most unusual group of people and, you know, things that have never been applied in this area before and combination of know-how. And it's really based on whether the young people in the, in the labs and the faculty members get excited about the challenge. And, um, and as a result, innovation begins to happen. We have created a unique structure uh, we call our translation funnel, uh, where we, and we're, in a, we're part of Harvard, but we're also consortium with MIT, BU, all the Harvard hospitals. So we kind of leverage the whole Boston Cambridge ecosystem. But we have hired into the V's people with 10, 20, 30 years in product development from every type of company you can imagine. Sustainability, uh, computers, you know, sound software, pharma, biotech, aerospace, and they're, they're part of our teams who help translate technologies. We have our own strategic intellectual property attorneys. We have our own business development people. So we actually very early on um, teach people about, uh, you know, putting in uh, what we call report of inventions, which, which gets feedback from a lawyer who's, who's not writing a patent, but he's saying, this isn't patentable because it's not novel. Or he's saying, 
-hmm. It's not patentable, but if you did this, this, and this, this could be amazing. That actually then affects a grad student, a postdoc, to change their experimental design to be on the shortest distance path to impact. And so that immediately gets things going. And then we've created structures to provide funding and support where we will bring our business development people in, we'll bring our people with product development with a, a young group of people who are passionate about, like they want to change the world by solving this problem. And we ask them to like identify early on uh, an application that, that they think would be a high value impact. It may not be the final one, but all of a sudden to focus like you are almost starting a company, but just thinking about solving a problem, bringing your business development people to find out like, is this really the important problem? Is there a market? Are there investors? Start talking to investors. And so this is where we cross between academia and the industrial world that we are de-risking. We're de-risking technically, we're de-risk commercially. We work on cost of manufacturing. We work on, we've done clinical trial. And so we're getting things much more matured because a big problem in any technology getting out of academic labs has been the valley of death, which is it's too early or your postdoc leaves and gets a job and nobody will ever pick it up again or the patents are submitted but not followed up. We really bring it along so that it can be a handoff, meaning often our people go out in a startup or we license it. And, you know, we're responsible for almost 25% of all of Harvard's intellectual property and in startups every year. And as we only have 11 core faculty and, and you know, 15 associate, all of whom have labs in other departments. So it's been quite an amazing experience. Well, so it sounds like this approach to engineering has the potential to really, as we said earlier, like address some big problems. And some of these problems people are coming to you with or you're identifying. I started by noting that the biological inspiration of this approach to engineering might make engineering very accessible and exciting to people who otherwise wouldn't have really cared too much about engineering. I think nature has that kind of like drawing in power of curiosity. Uh, but I'm wondering though, I mean, there are some people who have a like almost like a, like a sacred view of nature. And I could imagine there could be some people who are a little bit concerned about this direction of engineering, that it might be kind of commodifying a little bit too much of what they think is kind of the sacred natural world. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've ever faced any kind of concern or criticism that like, like you know, Don, what you're doing is you're taking these beautiful you know, natural processes and you're sort of finding a way to commercialize it and, and to kind of, you know. Um, well, I, you know, I, I don't think we are, first of all, you know, man has commercialized natural processes since the beginning of time, but that's, we're actually not. We're being inspired by it and we're creating something new or else it wouldn't be patentable. <laughs> uh, you know, we can't <laughs> exactly. patent things yeah. that exist. So exactly. yeah. what we're trying to do is save our world. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're not gonna be here very long. And, you know, uh, non-degradable, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, plastics that are just accumulating in the environment. You know, we worked on biodegradable plastics. We're working on right now bacteria and enzymes that we can de degrade a mixture of plastics that you could maybe put in a complex uh, you know, compost pile as opposed to people working on like one plastic at a time because that's not the reality of the challenge. The challenge is much more. You know, we're basically trying to use nature to, to, to help the survival of nature of which we're part of it, but the environment is what we're trying to save. So I, I have never had that. I mean, I've had with organs on chips, people worried that you, know, uh, you, you, might, you know, might create uh, chips that start thinking, but that's not really what these, what, what is possible with these sorts of chips. Um, so no, I haven't. Well, here's another way to put the point. The, the, the approach that you're taking, I think has a really nice connection to sustainability because after all nature is kind of self-sustaining. And the criticism that people have had maybe of, of too much technology is that it's gotten us to the point where we're out of balance with nature. You know, uh, how can engineering get us out of a problem that maybe in the past it, it was part of the, the, the cause for the problem? I think the response would be if we take inspiration from nature and if we have a different approach, we actually can leverage kind of a, a holistic, naturalistic view of human activity. And I, I think we want to be more at one with our, our world, right? I mean, uh, in engineering, there's a term called compliance mismatch when you have a you know, a, a, a material, like a rigid material that's implanted in the body, but our body is soft and compliant, and that creates real problems. And what 
what biologically inspired engineering does is to allow you to think about designing systems that are seamlessly integrating with us. That could be inside your body, that could be in your environment, in your home, and I think that's the advantage of it. I do think it attracts people from many different areas. It attracts artists. That's been a big movement in the art, uh, you know, is bio-inspired design. Um, and then there's conversations because we're so open at the VC. It is such a kindergarten. We have artists that have come to us that we then collaborated with on exhibitions that then led to technologies, right. which is kind of an amazing thing. So I, I think this idea, you know, I, I, I mentioned Tensegrity where that Buckminster Fuller, the inventor of the geodesic dome and a big uh, sort of philosopher of the 60s um, was really came up with the Tensegrity concept. And, but he had this saying that I often present, which is that he said, nature has no separate departments of you know, biology, chemistry, physics, or art, which is true. But we are taught that way. We have, the, from the time you're in kindergarten to, edu you know, to, to schools and graduate schools, they're all siloed. But that's not the way it really works in the world. I think biologically inspired engineering is de facto trying to break those boundaries for the, you know, for the betterment of man. And, and the only way, our measures of success are having technologies that become products not just the paper, but a product that actually people use and that really makes things, improves the world. Um, you know, we're only 14 years in, so it's just beginning to, you know, have products that are out there. But, um, you know, it's really happening. And the other thing is we're training people, not didactically in a course. That's not how you learn how to be. It's, it's by apprenticing, which is how you learn really medicine as well. I mean, it's by doing. And so... You don't tell people to do interdisciplinary work. You put them in an environment where they all of a sudden have a challenge and they realize the guy down the hall knows the answer and then they start talking and then they both get excited and then a self-assembled team, which is biologically inspired too. And that's how the place works. Yeah. Is there room at the VIS for different cultural perspectives to come in and kind of have an impact on some of the work you guys do? Well, you know, it's interesting because I always say it's like Starship Enterprise. I mean, we have every country in the world probably represented. And um, I would say, you know, America is probably a minority of the people there. Uh, it, it's, um, that's science today. And so you do get cultural it, sometimes it's a challenge because you have different, you know, more styles, uh, have proximities to people. Those are all things that you have to work through if you want to do collaborative, transdisciplinary sort of stuff. So it is part of the training in a sense. You know, in your wildest dreams, if, if you were to look back in your career and say, this is the impact that we've had with the VIS and, with, and, and your work, what would you like to see happen? Like, well, what, what, what in your wildest dreams would be the biggest accomplishment? I would say my whole career, I'm someone who was sort of a maverick in that I saw connections that no one ever saw and I pursued them, I'm proud of that, but that, you know, it's so hard to question authority, particularly in the current world. And questioning authority is like the key to the next wave of enlightenment or advancement. And so in some ways I feel that even just the birth of biologically inspired engineering is sort of my is, is one of the major contributions I did, this idea of everybody's talking about, you know, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research, biologically inspired now. And I feel like I was part of that in a big way my whole life since I'm 17 years old, you know. So, so I think that is in a way, at, you know, I, I could point out to, you know, drugs that went to clinical trials or devices in clinical trials or organs on chips or this or that. But I, I think it's more um, realizing that there is value in looking at things different ways and pursuing a path that, that crosses boundaries. What area, what direction most excites you about the future of this work? I mean, I think there's, there, there's no doubt that artificial intelligence is coming in and, and so rapidly, and it's really going to change the way we do everything. You know, if you, if you just think right now, if you, ha if you have a family member who's been in the hospital and had had a you know, X-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI, you know, it's read by radiologists. There's no doubt it's getting, it, humans can't do it as good as these computers. I mean, it's not all there yet, but it's beginning, you're beginning to see these blips and it's gonna happen. So the question is like, you know, what can, what do we do? Uh, you know, what does man do? And it's really the creative process to do this sort of uh, crossing boundaries that didn't exist before. I mean, AI works with sort of what exists, right? And and so I, I think that's so the, I think that's one area of just at a, at a global scale. Uh, in terms of biologically inspired engineering itself, 
there's no doubt synthetic biology, which is really only 20, 25 years old at the, maybe 20 to 25 years. It's about to explode. And because it's not only engineering, you know, bacteria or yeast, but now it's human cells. You know, you're seeing uh, CAR T cells, these engineered immune cells that are using for cancer therapy. It's, those were pretty simple. It was like, you know, classic one gene engineering. Now people are engineering whole circuits in human cells. And now you could have programmable living cellular devices, we call them. So living cells as medical devices, totally seamless, biocompatible, biodegradable, um, you know, get to places where they want to do things, do it at a self-organizational level. I think that's gonna transform medicine. And then I, I mentioned examples of engineering manufacturing, biomaterials production, carbon sequestration. So in, 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 synthetic biology is a big part of what we do at the VEAS. I, I think that is, you know, genome engineering is a subset of that. Uh, the other is, um, you know, biomaterials, which crosses over with that because you can make biomaterials that way. But, you know, living materials, multifunctional materials, materials that have all these functionalities Rather than you're going to get this put in for the mechanical support, you're going to get this put in for electrical stimulus. I mean, have one thing that does it just like our body does it. And then finally, regeneration rather than artificial materials. Like I'm talking about medicine now. There's uh, Mike Levin does some amazing work at the VEAS. It's still in lower organs, but it's just amazing in terms of being able to redirect you know, formation of whole limbs and lower organisms and, or you know, an eye or a, just whatever you want. But he, he uses bioelectricity, another idea that is poo-pooed for 100 years and now just beginning to be recognized. And you always have to wonder, like, why was mechanics poo-pooed? Why was bioelectricity? And I don't know what the answer is. Some of it is sort of human nature of, like, we're doing, you know, genomics, genetics, and look how powerful it is. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could explain everything because we change a gene. But if you want to understand how the machinery of life works, and I mean man as well as plant, as well as insect, uh, it, it has to have physics as well as electronics as well as chemistry. And so I think that, you know, the opportunities are taking all these different approaches in the future and melding them into one. And that's what biologically inspired engineering does. Well, what I'm hearing from you is sort of a recapitulation of that, that first excitement, that love of of all these areas coming together back when you were a student. And, and I think you're living your life. That energy has never seemed to have dissipated. It's kind of carrying you throughout your There are ups and downs, career. I'll say that. But uh, thank you. I, I hope that's true. Well, thank you so much for joining us My today. pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.